Ladies and gentlemen, folks, thank you for coming today. My name is Klaus van der Tempel. I work at Stream Generale of the TU Delft. I'm a program maker, and uh, one of the programs that I've devoted myself to this year is a series that we're calling Global Philosophies. And what are we doing? We are inviting guests to talk about philosophy, spirituality, religion from across the world. So we've had a few lectures in this series so far, and there are more to come. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that at the end. But today, we're going to talk about indigenous philosophy. We have a special guest today, Antoine Dill. Mm -hmm. He's spoken for us before. He is a chemical engineer, so familiar to most of the people here and his background. Mm -hmm. But he has a long CV. I'm not going to name everything that you've done, Antoine, because it's a lot. Um, but important for us to know today mm -hmm. is that he is a former director of NINSE, which is the Dutch, uh, let me say if I can get the English translation right, the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its Legacy. Correct? Very good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was nervous about that one. And secondly, he's also the founder of a platform called Nature's Narrative. And through Nature's Narrative, this is how I found out about Antoine and met him. He uh, provides a platform for people to speak uh, from their own indigenous background mm -hmm. and their culture and their experiences, for example, with sustainability, with climate change. And uh, as somewhat of an expert on indigenous knowledge and cultures, I've invited him to speak to us today about indigenous philosophy. So I want you to give a warm round of applause to Antoine. We'll have about 30 minutes of talking and then time for Q&A. Uh, and I give the word to you, Antoine. All right, uh, class, thank you. Um, let me pull up the first slide. I, I hope you guys can uh, uh, read it. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to yeah, thank uh, TU Delft and especially Klaas uh, uh, for inviting me and for this uh, exciting series that you've uh, put together. And also, uh, of course, thank you all for coming uh, uh, to see this lecture. And it brings uh, sweet memories seeing you guys here because I've al also did some some studies uh, here at TU Delft, but that, that's, a, that's a really long time ago. Um, you know, the, the, the prologue, um, you know, what, what indigenous typically do and what I also do is, first of all, to thank the ancestors and ask them for guidance. So I'm not going to read anything, uh, everything because I've already, uh, uh, you know, asked for the guidance and for permission to do this. And uh, the only thing that I would like to highlight is that Whenever I use the word we in this presentation, um, I refer to we in Western society. Uh, words like humanity, uh, humankind will be explained to make clear um, to whom uh, that is uh, referred to. Because um, I want to move away from the Eurocentrism where if we use the, the word we, we, we mean everybody in the world. So I hope you uh, understand this and that's kind of what I wanted to uh, uh, explain first. So um, let me start um, by saying that, let me go back, let me start by saying that I am a product of the Western educational system. I was shaped by the Cartesian ontological dualism concept and by the Newtonian mechanistic worldview. Um, when I graduated in the 90s from the University of Amsterdam, my ways of knowing was fully equipped with the latest Western sustainability technologies as I descended upon the corporate world. I landed a fantastic job in the United States at a big multinational, and I traveled around the world to help corporate customers improve sustainability, reduce their emissions and improve the bottom line. I think these are terms very familiar for you guys, I, I guess. And at the pinnacle of my career, I became the company's sustainability manager for uh, Europe, Africa and the Middle East. I was proud of my work. Yes, I was reducing the impact on the planet. Yes, I helped companies stay within environmental limits set by environmental laws, implemented innovative membrane and renewable technologies. I applied life cycle analysis to study environmental risks. And hell yes, I had moral standing 
talking about the great things that I was doing for society. But there was a little seed in me that started to grow. A seed that was planted in me by my grandmother, Nellie Richards. At a time when I was just a toddler uh, of, of around four years old, um, that seed is actually one of my first memories. Sitting at uh, the feet of my grandmother in our backyard in Paramaribo, Suriname, while she was tending the earth and her vegetable garden, she said to me, and I quote, Mama Aisa, e ji un sofuru ma un oktu musu jin mama Aisa baka, e un musu sorgu bung di eng. That is Stranang Tongo. And her words meant, Mother Earth gives us so much gifts, but we have to reciprocate her generosity and we need to take care of her as well. My grandmother's ways of knowing and purpose in life were rooted in an African indigenous philosophy, a value system going back millennia. Her words basically echoed an ethic of reciprocity, an interconnectedness to Mother Earth and all living beings based on care, gratitude, and a collective responsibility to make sure all of us can flourish. Her positionality in the web of life was crystal clear and so beautiful for me to experience. That seed of rem re rem remembrance made me wonder what sustainability actually means. If we are only slowing environmental degradation, if we keep poisoning rivers, polluting air and doing it at, for us in the West, acceptable rates, set by our environmental laws and international agreements like Paris and Glasgow. At the same time, we are driving indigenous communities and other living beings of their ancestral lands, replacing thriving ecosystems with monocultures so we can have our soya products, electric car batteries, solar panels, and claim that we are reducing our footprint. So. I ask myself, has the Western worldview and epistemology created a deceptive prism that has discolored and poisoned our thinking and ethical values, and also our imagination? Because it's my opinion that modernity and the rise of our so-called um, tec technologically advanced civilization has come at a huge price a staggering loss of human life and biodiversity, continuing destruction of natural habitats. And I was part of that. I am complicit. I am also complicit. What we were doing, I concluded, amounts to a metaphorical sentence of death to Mother Earth by a thousand cuts, what's also referred to as the concept of Lynchy. We call it the Anthropocene, the current geological age we live in as, th as the period in which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. I would like to call it a disastrous influence on climate and environment. And if we say human activity, we should mention activities based on our Western economical, productional and technological systems. So. How did we get here? How did we get so disconnected from the earth and the community of life that is surrounding us? And what is our or what is your positionality in the web of life moving forward? That seed of remembrance, where we come from, we all have it in us, but we need to reattach the imaginative umbilical cord that connects us and reroutes re us to the forgotten ethics, the forgotten values, the, forgo the forgotten ways of knowing that is instilled in us by Mother Nature. 
So, in contrast, indigenous peoples and cultures live on 20% of planet's surface. And they safeguard 80% of the Earth's biodiversity on their ancestral lands. So let that sink in for a minute. These are astonishing facts and figures. You probably know them. But if you put it another way, 5% of the world's population are guardians and defenders of 80% of Earth's bi biodiversity that, that is left. Yet this defending of the Earth comes at a cost. In 2020 alone, 227 indigenous land and environmental activists were murdered for defending their ancestral land in Peru, Mexico, Brazil, Congo, South Africa, the Philippines, India, and so on. Basically, the extractive industries, the agribusinesses, were on the deadliest drivers of violence. Our hunger for minerals, soy products, palm oil is causing incursions deep into indigenous territories and other communal lands. The biodiversity and abundance of resources in indigenous uh, communities and territories is no coincidence. This has been the case for tens of thousands of years. This is due to a deep connection with the natural and spiritual world. The cultivation of traditional eco ecological knowledge and practices, advanced cosmology and ways of knowing that are rooted in indigenous worldviews. So what are wor worldviews exactly? A worldview is basically a collection of values, creation stories which guide thought, purpose and action. It is expressed in ethics, philosophy, science, and finds its way into social constructions, art, and culture, and also shapes the way people and communities position themselves in the universe and how they treat other people, animals, and nature in general. So let's draw a contrast with our Western worldview and then we'll slide into indigenous worldviews and ethics of reciprocity. In the Judeo-Christian creation story, God instructed man to rule over all animals and subdue the earth. The, influ the influential English historian Thomas Buckle wrote in his famous book, History of Civilization in 1857, that in Europe, man is stronger than nature, and in the rest of the world, nature is stronger than man. The Europe man has subjugated nature to his needs and wants. In addition, Western worldviews is also shaped by the legacy of philosophers like Socrates and the French philosopher René Descartes, who we all know from his philosophical proposition, cogito ergo sum, je pense donc je suis, usually translated into English as I think, therefore I am, which puts a lot of emphasis on the ratio and uh, centralizes also the in individual and one's own thinking. If you compare that to, for example, the Ubuntu uh, philosophy um, or the Ubuntu worldview from South Africa and also mm -hmm. Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, Ubuntu is often translated as humanity towards others and towards both humans, animals, and nature, and comes from a strong belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity and also all non-human persons. Summed up, the Ubuntu proposition reflects I am because we are we are because you are. In the Ubuntu uh, philosophy, a person becomes a person through other people, the natural world and also through the recognition of the other in its uniqueness and or difference. So there is no me versus them 
or man versus nature, this furthermore suggests that my humanity or, or, or culture is not embedded in me as an individual. So the I am is fluid and dynamic and depends on the relationship to the otherness. My being is created and can only be sustained by the otherness and the natural environment and vice versa through reciprocal relationships. There are many more indigenous, indigenous worldviews and philosophies, too many to, to, to mention. On the slide I've put uh, a, a couple more like Buen Vivere, also from the Inuit and from uh, New Zealand. But that uh, lecture already has been given, I guess, yes? Um, so, so like I said, there are many, many more uh, indi indigenous worldviews and philosophies. Um, and many of these worldviews are grounded in creation stories. The creation story of the Iroquois. Animals, birds, otters, beavers, and a giant turtle in the Iroquois creation story saved Sky Woman from falling from the sky into the ocean that covered the earth. After saving Sky Woman, the animals built an island for her on the back of a turtle. Sky Woman planted seeds, she planted fruits, and so Turtle Island came into existence the land that we in the West now call North America, but the land that is referred to Turtle Island by the indigenous communities in North America. According to the Sun people in South Africa, all the creatures of the earth once lived in an underground world. In this place, humans and animals lived together peacefully. They could understand each other and did not fear each other. Later all this changed, but at one time there was equality among animals and people. Another creation story to kind of highlight um, the, the thinking of indigenous culture is the Beninese creation story. Heaven and earth got married and gave birth to three types of children, trees, animals, and humans. Trees are the elder brother of man and forest areas continue a means to communicate with the gods. So if we look at all these creation stories, and there are thousands of creation stories um, from indigenous uh, uh, cultures, um, but there, there is a common thread in many of these stories, and that is the earth as the mother, trees and plants are considered our teachers, our brothers and sisters, and animals as our spiritual kin, and also equals. So there, there is an interconnected interconnectedness between all living things. To understand oneself re requires understanding all that is around us. For example, to hurt the land is to hurt the community the community and to hurt oneself. Indigenous worldviews can be characterized as relational based on respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. So let us look at um, the concept of respect first. Respect is considered um, a very basic um, uh, thing to, to have as a, as a virtue because it maintains a healthy relationship between human and non-human persons with whom we share the environment. There's an obligation to show respect to those non-human persons that supply their food and other, necess and other necessities and in turn the non-human persons reciprocate by being willing to take um, to be taken by worthy human persons or renting good harvest. So with the last sentence I mean if you show respect to animals then they will be um, they will be in your favor so when you go hunting 
some of the animals will actually give themselves up to you. And that, that's, a, that's a difficult concept to understand, but that's really a concept that is uh, very, um, that is really being used in, in indigenous cultures. They really believe in that. I was once in, um, in, in, in Suriname, and um, we went hunting. I wasn't hunting, but we went hunting with some in indigenous cultures in the, uh, in, the, in the Amazon area in Suriname. And what they did first is to ask for permission to go on the hunt. And we had to be very quiet, and they were hunting some deer and also on monkeys. And yeah, for me that was <laughs> kind of terrible, but okay, that, 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 that's the way they live. And at some point, you know, there was a deer right in front of us, and so he had, a, he, had a, he had a clear shot, but he didn't take the shot. So I asked him, why don't, don't you take the shot? And he said, yeah, that deer doesn't deserve to, to die today. And I didn't understand how he knew that, but then one or two hours later, there was another deer that actually, it, it's amazing that that looked at us, turned away, and basically offered uh, uh, her or himself to be taken. So I I it's amazing how indigenous people know, you know, uh, how to hunt, when to hunt, and uh, basically do a respectful uh, killing, if you if you if you can uh, call it that way. Um, uh, another important. Um, concept of indigenous um, ways of being and doing and tending to the earth is the seventh generation principle. The seventh generation principle is based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy and uh, it basically states that the decision of each generation should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. So can you imagine if you have that, you know, as, as, as a guiding principle, how sustainable your life will be? And um, thi this is a principle that's applied by many indigenous cultures. So like the Iroquois, like I mentioned, but also the Maoris in uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand. They have similar concepts of intergenerational planning and connecting past present and future. In some traditions, they also look back seven generations to remind themselves how their predecessors' decisions affected them. This might be also a good exercise maybe for us to find answers how we got into the current humanitarian and also climate crisis. Now I um, will get into the the ethics of reciprocity. Um, ethics of reciprocity starts with gratitude of all beautiful gifts that Mother Nature gives us to sustain and enjoy life. And at the same time, knowing that the gifts are not for us to hold on indefinitely, but these gifts also need to be shared with our community of living beings, with our ancestors and also with future generations. It also invokes a deep sense of humility, respect and responsibility to take care of the earth and the community around us. The understanding of the necessity of a reciprocal relationship is key to keep a harmonious balance so all life on earth can flourish. Ethical values are key to make this work. So it's about knowing what is wrong and what is right for the collective. It is also about moral standards and values that guide behavior and actions, both on an individual and collective level. For example, one of those practices in indigenous communities is what we call the ethics 
of reciprocity, of course, and the honorable harvest. The honorable harvest, I'm not sure if you ever heard about it, but it's a practice that governs the exchange of life for a life. If you take a life during hunt, or even if, if you harvest a, 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 a crops, um, if you do that, you only can do that for a good reason. And this practice makes sure that resources are not depleted, that hunting, fishing, or gathering resources is carried out in response only to need. And in the absence of need, no such activities are undertaken. So you cannot do anything there. So what do a lot of indigenous uh, uh, cultures do before they harvest or before they go hunting? The first thing that you do is you, you ask permission. And for example, if you want to cut down a tree to build a house, you ask the tree for permission. And you also abide by the answer. For us, it's, it's a strange concept because how do you know what the answer is? And, um, and that's very interesting because indigenous cultures have been living within the spiritual and natural environment for thousands and thousands of years. And they can actually, I've seen it myself, they can communicate with plants. They can communicate with trees. They know what they feel. So they know the answer. Um, one of the other uh, guiding principles is you take only what you need and take only that what is given. So for example, large uh, scale uh, um, extractions of excavations, it's not done in indi indigenous communities because that is not been given by Mother Earth to us. Also, it's also important when you go hunting or when you uh, uh, go harvesting your crops, you introduce yourself to the animals, you introduce yourself to the plants. If you enter a forest, you introduce yourself and you, you let them know that you are coming and for what purpose. Another interesting uh, uh, um, a principle is never take more than half. Leave some for others. And if we talk about others, it's not just human beings, but also non-human persons. Leave also some for the trees. Leave al also some for other animals. So once you've, once you've done hunting or done your harvesting, you also give thanks for what you have been, been given. And this is typically done through certain uh, ceremonies and, and rituals. And there are many more of these, let's say, guiding principles. But um, if you really follow this, this, this code, then, um, and, you s and then, then, like they say, then the earth will last forever. And I truly, I truly believe that because I think the indigenous cultures through their uh, philosophies and ethics of reciprocity have proven and shown to us that they are the true uh, custodians and defenders of, of the earth. Okay, and then I'm already at my last slide. And um, so, like I said, the ethics of reciprocity is a very uh, important concept in indig indigenous uh, philosophies and uh, the role that indigenous communities play in protecting the, the environment is uh, essential and comes from all these beautiful uh, set of principles and ethical values. Okay, that's what I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Mm -hmm. So we have time for questions now, guys. Does anybody have a burning question to kick us off? We have one in the back. D are you OK with asking the question in the microphone? Hi. Um, thank you for the lecture. I have a question about the seven generation um, principle. Mm -hmm. It said that something about um, to continue living sustainably, mm -hmm. uh, seven generations in the future. And I was wondering, um, is this? Uh, yeah, that like 
does it mean that we keep on living the way we do now with this kind of lifestyle and the way we consume things? Or uh, does it mean we go to another kind of way of life? I was wondering. Yeah. If, if it, I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, so basically what it means that every decision you make today, everything you do in your life today, you have to take into account what will be the impact on uh, seven generations from now, seven generations into the future. So um, if you have that uh, uh, way of doing, that way of knowing, then basically the only option you have left is to be really sustainable. That's the only option you, you basically have, have, have left. And if you look at indigenous uh, communities all over the world, you know, they, they have zero waste. They uh, uh, basically are in, in, a, in a beautiful dance with their environment. They are so in balance and there is no pollution of the water. There is no uh, 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 sources of food. So everything they do is basically uh, perfectly tuned within their environment. And if we here in the West would also adopt um, such a principle, I think uh, uh, things would be uh, uh, a lot better than I it is right now. So is that that, that clear? Or yeah. Do we have another question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, for your lecture. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's very inspiring to hear how indigenous people live and take care of the land and uh, I think the principles that you explained are yeah inspiring in that sense but I'm just wondering uh, how how can I apply this to my own life living mm -hmm. in Western society have you do you have any reflections on no how, how to do this <laughs> now as a you know person no, <laughs> I, I, I think that, that that's a good thing to to think about if you take this all in and you know, do some more uh, research and, you know, like I said in, in the beginning of the lecture that, you know, I, I am also, I, I, I am complicit, you know, the way I live. Um, so actually what I, what I did, I started a, a project, we bought a house in France and we gonna live there on an, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a no waste concept. And so that's my way of, you know, giving back and we're gonna uh, plant gardens um yeah we're gonna be in nature we're gonna reconnect with mother earth i think that that's the first step i think like i said you know we here in the west we are disconnected from uh the source uh, wha wha where we come from so you know it, it it's good to think about how how can you do it you know um is it to buy uh, soy products or, or an electric car? No, that, that, that's not the solution. That, that only makes the problem uh, uh, worse. So I don't have a uh, 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 clear, let's say, uh, project plan for you, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. Antoine, can I ask you a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. What is this knowledge, uh, which clearly you've also taken to heart for yourself and you've made changes in your lifestyle, what is it meant for your career as an engineer? Um, basically, it, 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 ended, it ended my, my career, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, you know what, what, what happened, you know, after 20 years you're doing that, that work, um, like I said, that, that seed that was planted in me by my grandma, it suddenly, started to grow. And actually what happened is that there was a, a, a project for a, a nuclear facility. And uh, for me, that was one bridge too far. So that was for me uh, the point to decide, you know, I need a career change. So I went into the nonprofit sector and became a director of, of NINSE and did some other projects, went into to politics and did some work there. Um, but I, 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 I truly think, and you know, it, it's up to everyone, but uh, corporate sustainability is, is, is part of the problem. Um, yeah, thank you. My question kind of links into what we were just discussing now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that uh, the ethics of reciprocity, as you've talked about it today, mm -hmm. uh, they seem very much focused on an individual connection with nature or maybe you know, a human community's connection with the environment they live in. Mm -hmm. um, but the world we, as a you know, Western society, if you, you know, if you call it that, uh, lives in, it's very industrialized. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the engineering projects, the large scale excavations, that kind of exploitation mm -hmm. of nature, um, that as a concept um, doesn't seem to match with, the, with these ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so what, what's my question now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, and, and uh, okay, um, I, I, I think I understand what you mean, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course. Um, and that kind of also ties into the, the question of, I didn't catch your name, but um, of, the, of your colleague uh, to your right. Um, yeah, basically, you know, we, 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 we are on a crossroad. So what is our next step going to be? Do we believe that uh, Paris and, and, and Glasgow is going to save us? Um, I think some, some of us will be saved, but, but then maybe uh, the rest of the world uh, will be gone. And uh, you know that uh, the very uh, rich are al already planning uh, missions to Mars. So <laughs> maybe 100 years from now, there will be uh, Mars will be uh, colonized and the, the Earth will be uh, left basically uh <laughs> in a disastrous uh, 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 mode. Anton, what do you think yeah. about the, the urge towards circularity, the circular economy, for example, which has some of these principles in it, right? The reuse yeah. of resources and yeah. not waste it and pollute yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I if you look, uh, for example, I will come back to your question. If you look at uh, a permaculture, uh, uh, regener reg regenerative agriculture, yeah, th those are all concepts from indigenous uh, peoples. Also, uh, circularity, you know, that is also a concept from uh, uh, indigenous people. But I, I, I agree, you know, it, it, it's better than doing nothing and it will help. And like I said, it will only slow down the environmental uh, degradation. That's the only thing it is doing. It's not a game changer. So whether we will... Uh, uh you know, uh, uh, be on this giant uh, uh, ship Titanic, what we call uh, the Earth, you know, where it goes slowly to the iceberg or whether it goes fast to the I iceberg, that, that makes a difference. But the way we're doing it right now, we're slowly heading to the iceberg. So we're just uh, uh, delaying the inevitable. Th that that's actually what we're doing. Can I? Oh, um well, thank you for the presentation. I agree with uh, what you said. And I disagree with the fact that you say that we're slowly going towards the iceberg because okay. I think <laughs> it's much faster than that. <laughs> yeah. And I also okay. think there is uh, something that was not said but has to be said, and that is uh, uh, yeah, inequality in mm -hmm. uh, climate change and sustainability and the ethics. I come from Guatemala, it's a country where 60% of the population continues to be indigenous. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have been exploited and uh, mm -hmm. you know, oppressed for 500 years and continue to be so. Mm -hmm. And also in the rest of the world, indigenous population are being uh, destroyed, just like you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this knowledge that we're losing, which mm -hmm. is essentially the only way in which humanity can survive because the way in which mm -hmm. Western world is driving uh, civilization can no continue. Like this is physically impossible mm -hmm. that we continue to have the level of consumption that we have right now. Mm -hmm. So we must fundamentally transform the way in which we relate to nature and the way in which we produce and consume things. And there is the problem of wealth and power concentration. The wealthier you are, Currently, the more you pollute, and we're all heading towards this. So yeah. there must be a fundamental change in the way in which power is managed by society. We should yeah. actually move towards democracy. To if we, we want need to a, we need a revolution. Sustainable. <laughs> that's well, what we yeah, need. Exactly, that's <laughs> what I'm talking about. That is the Absolutely. one thing you didn't mention, because that's yeah. the only thing that can yeah. actually save us from mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. Western 
way of life. Yeah. This is the exception for 96% of humanity we have mm -hmm. lived in communities. And it's only the 4% the, the and especially the last 200 years yeah. that we have completely disconnected mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to go back to this. But this requires precisely what you said, a revolution, a transformation mm -hmm. of power, wealth, yeah. production. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I couldn't have said it better, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, a absolutely. I, I, I How do we do yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, you know, um, we, we, we have now ex Extinction Rebellion, we have the, 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 the climate marches, but I think also these orga organizations, they need to become dec decolonial, you know, because believing that the system we're in and believing in green technology and uh, carbon trading and uh, setting more uh, uh, reductions of uh, uh, whatever uh, 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 pollu pollutions, whatever, you know, it's not going to help. We need a fundamental uh, uh, paradigm shift in our way of living, but also in our way of thinking. And like, like I um, told in the presentation, the worldview and the uh, philosophical basis of the West now I is based on the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, values, is based on um, certain philosophies of certain um, uh, philosophers like Descartes, uh, Kant, Hegel, etc. And um, these people were also flawed, you know? They also had very, uh, some of them had uh, uh, racist ideas about uh, uh, the global south, about uh, the African continent. So what we need is here in the West, we need to reconnect with our humanity. It's in all of us, you know, and, th and th that is good. And, um, you know, the, the organization, like I said, like Extinction Rebellion, uh, uh, all the organizations from the Climate March, they need to go for a revolution. So how can we do that? You know, uh, we need to start to organize. We need to tell uh, the, the people in power, you know, we're not going to vote on you anymore. We're not going to do it anymore. So there are a lot of things you can look at in, uh, in, 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 in history, you know, from uh, all the resistance uh, uh, groups, how they have done it. But I think we have to come up with, with something different. Maybe that's, I think it's up to you, up to you guys, you know. Maybe you should occupy uh, Teju Delft, you know, and... and <laughs> Before we get to you, so we have a call to revolution, yeah. as they say, that escalated quickly. Mm -hmm. um, before anything like that happens, I'm wondering, do you know, yeah. if people want to get more informed about mm -hmm. the philosophies, the spiritualities yeah. that you talked about today, do you mm -hmm. have any uh, quick suggestions for where they can search? You know, I, I, I can send you um, a reading list sure. and, and a lot of information. So if people are interested, they can look at those uh, sources. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, follow-up question before before I get to you. Um, mm -hmm. But can I ask one question? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, who's in favor for a revolution? Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay, no, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just yeah. A moment. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Um, like going back to holding. Ah, you hold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, to the. the so what we also need to do is that uh, the fact that their own epistemology has mm -hmm. been until now a way of resistance, like the principles of their... So going back to you, that you are from Guatemala, like instead of, you know, also the way that you look at the indigenous people, that maybe, you know, it's like what you are going to learn from them and the way to resist them. So what I mean, it's like we are in crisis. Tell me about crisis. Those people have been 500 years in crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the ways that they had to resist until now? No. So now in the moment that when the when the world is going to get worse, those are the populations that the government start suffer the most because they mm -hmm. are the poorest, basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, But there is a lot of way to learn on how they organize themselves to resist because their own epistemology mm -hmm. is about that, th that organization, that communal organization. Yeah. 
And, and I think that we would want to start a revolution to organize ourselves as community, first understand ourselves as a community, then they are the references that we have to look at. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, and the only thing I want to add to that is that, um, yes, we, we can look at, uh, uh, as an example, to indigenous uh, resistance, but also in our own backyard here in Europe. Yeah. We, also f we also have a history. And um, if we go far back enough, we still had the commons here where uh, a ground was not property when it was a uh, common good. So it, it changed, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in the 16th century. Um, so I think we also have good examples here. Uh, we have the French Revolution, we have other revolutions. So I think we look for examples, but then we have to also look at our situation and what fits best uh, for our culture. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking, like for example, like I'm mm. an architect, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I'm looking for those examples that mm -hmm. how how can we bring that thinking to to our situation? And there mm -hmm. are some architects, uh, for example, in order to get access to a uh, good quality of housing because of yeah. the lack of housing um, that happened in Barcelona and Spain. Yeah. Uh, they were doing precisely that. They were changing the model the economy. Uh, so they were renting the piece of land to the to the government or to the in order to build yeah. something collaboratively uh, together, like not only the the architects but the but the people who were going mm -hmm. to. So, of course, it's exhausting, but it was a very good uh, participatory example, and they will rent that piece yeah. of land for seventy five years, which yeah. is uh, you know. So yes, they. Th we can do things, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, um uh. yeah it, it's a nice project in, in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah I, I'm familiar with uh, that project. Yeah. I'm afraid we have run out of time. Okay, maybe. Is it a short question? <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, a long well, question is good. There's a lot. There's a lot yeah. of questions, yeah. but uh, I would invite you guys to stick around. I don't know, Antoine. Do you have time to stay as well? Yeah, I have time. Absolutely. We'll yeah. get into more informal conversation. Yeah. But for now, uh, I think we have to uh, mm -hmm. wrap up the lecture and also the recording. But before mm -hmm. we do that, Antoine, could you skip to the next slide or the last slide? Yeah. Next one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, we were already here. Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah. I just want to let you guys yeah. know that there are more events coming up in the series. Uh, also, related to what you said, on Monday we have this lecture on African philosophy and literature, which is about how um, African authors from both Africa, the Caribbean area, uh, New York and Harlem, from the African diaspora, uh, in the 20th century uh, took this decolonial mm -hmm. attitude mm -hmm. and tried to build their own pan-African uh, identity. It's going to be a fascinating lecture. I invite all of you guys to attend it next week. We also have others in the series about Sufism. There's going to be a few about Japanese culture. We're going to get back to more indigenous uh, philosophy in May. Um, but another one that's not on this list actually is that Antoine is coming back next week to talk at the TU Delft at X. Uh, we have an event called Hidden from View, which you can also find on the SG website. It's not going to be more recorded. It's going to be more of a discussion evening about the kind of issues that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And who knows, it might even be a catalyst for more revolution. So mm -hmm. seriously, come check this out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Wow. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for coming out today. I was mm -hmm. really uh, enjoying the conversation, the questions, the discussions, the examples. And mm -hmm. Antoine, I think we uh, owe you another warm round of applause. OK, thank you. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you also. <laughs>